healthy in this video, we're going to discuss the zero loss and low loss spectra and imaging. In this image, it shows a standard EOS spectra you see. I0 is the intensity of the zero loss peak. IP is the intensity of the plasmon peak. The scale along the y-axis is linear. In the previous video, the scale was log. The low loss region of the EOS spectrum is shaded in blue. It covers the zero loss peak and the plasmon peak. Because the y-axis, the intensity, is in the linear scale, so the characteristic edges will be so weak you can hardly see them. Let's first focus on the zero loss peak to look at how it can help us to get better images and uh, diffraction patterns. The example on the left shows a fairly thick crystalline specimen. The one on the top is a regular TEM micrograph. The one down the bottom is only formed using the zero loss peak. So the image down the bottom is only formed by the direct electron beam and the elastically scattered electrons. The inelastically scattered electrons are filtered away. You can see a dramatic improvement in this image compared to the previous one. The same technique can be applied to amorphous materials as well to simultaneously improve resolution and the contrast. In addition to the zero loss imaging, you can also do zero loss diffraction patterns. You have seen this example in the previous video. The one on the left is just the raw data. The one on the right is the diffraction pattern only formed using the zero loss peak. Again, you can see a dramatic improvement here. Moving on to the plasmon peak, there is a wealth of information you can obtain from the plasmon peak. For example, you can get the chemical fingerprinting, you can calculate the dielectric constant, you can look at the plasmon loss analysis, you can also study the single electron excitation, you can estimate the band gap, you can also measure the specimen thickness. Now, let's look at them one by one. The spectra here shows an example of chemical fingerprinting of metallic aluminum and aluminum bearing compounds. Although all samples contain aluminum, because the local bonding information is different, the plasmon peaks are different. You can compare what you have acquired in your experiment to the database and deduce exactly what kind of compound you have. You can also use the plasmon peak to calculate the dielectric constant. Assuming we have a free electron model, i.e. here, on the left-hand side of the equation, is the single scattering spectrum intensity. On the right-hand side, I0 is the intensity of the zero loss peak, T is the specimen thickness, K is a constant, beta is the collection angle, theta E is the characteristic scattering angle, epsilon is the part we are trying to calculate, it is the imaginary part of the dielectric constant. You can use the Kramer's chronic analysis to obtain the real part of the dielectric constant. We can also just look at the plasmon loss. When doing such analysis, we need to first remove the background from the zero loss peak, then perform the deconvolution. The model here is called Fourier log deconvolution. We'll discuss more on the deconvolution models in the next video. After removing the background and the deconvolution, what you get essentially is similar to VUV, the valence ultraviolet spectra. In the valence yields approach, you have a larger energy range. You can look at higher frequency information. You can also use the plasmon peak to map the surface plasmon of plasmonic nanoparticles, as the example shown on the right. In the same material, due to the local geometry, you can have very different plasmonic responses. We can also look at the plasmon peak and study the single electron excitation. The single electron excitation happens when there is enough energy to excite a single electron in the valence band to either change the orbital state or to move it to an unoccupied state in the conduction band. If this happens, you will see the interband transition as shown here. In this example, the polystyrene has the interband transition, but the polyethylene doesn't have it. If you have a copolymer, you can map the interband transition to tell you where the polystyrene is, where the polyethylene is. We can also look at the onset of the plasmon peaks to tell us the band gap of the material. If the material has a band gap, the peak intensity immediately after the zero loss peak should be zero or just the background noise. 
in the case of silicon, because the band cap is so small, it is buried in the zero loss peak. In silicon dioxide, there's no signal here, but it starts picking up signal from around 10 EV. So the band gap of silica is around 10 EV. Similarly, in the silicon nitride, here is the band gap. And starting from here, that's when you start seeing the intensity and the band gap is around six or seven EV. Last, but definitely not the least, is the sample thickness measurement using yields. The equation is super simple. So the sample thickness is equal to lambda P, I P over I naught. Lambda P is the mean free path of phonon in your material. So it is material specific. I P is the intensity of the plasma peak. I naught is the intensity of the zero loss peak. Here is an example from the textbook. By looking at the ratio of the zero loss peak and the first plasma peak, you can estimate the sample thickness. One thing I'd like to draw your attention to is I can tell straight away the sample is fairly thick. It is evidenced by the presence of multiple plasma peaks. If we look at the energy of the plasma peak, the first plasma peak will be at EP. The second plasma peak will be at 2 EP. The third plasma peak will be at 3 EP. In the next video, we'll move beyond 50 EV and look at the core loss spectra and the imaging.